Welcome to another edition of the Dogger Pass Podcast. This for UFC Vegas 70. This episode of the Dogger Pass Podcast and all episodes of the Dogger Pass Podcast are brought to you by Prize Picks. Use promo code DOP when making a new account to get a match up to $100 on your first deposit. Cody Saftik is on the line. Producer Megan is on the stick. Cody, what was that? 10 of 11. Perfect hedge out opportunity. Somebody's winning on this show. And it's probably better that it's you. Because you're the man that people are tuning in for these days. So, uh, congratulations. Perfect, perfectly played by you. Um, and uh, hopefully we can keep the good good times rolling on, on your end there. Yeah, and last week was a card that I don't think we had very high expectations for. So, I think it's just a case of when the bounces do go the way you think, it's great times. Technically speaking, though, didn't hit the PRP, right? Because Jessica Drosh did lose. Definitely took the hedge out. Glad I took the hedge out, but... I'll take out sets up like that all day. But this season, we got to hit the PRP at some point. Wish it was last weekend. Hopefully, it's this uh, weekend coming up. All we can do, another clean slate. Also, last week, it's like, ah, do you like this? Do you not like that? The card's weak. This week's card, not all Apex cards are created equal. This is a nice-looking card. Mostly favorites, a little chalky for my liking. But at the same time, I feel like there's still some good value spots and uh, some spots that we hopefully can mix and match some decent parlays together well you can hopefully you can help me out a bunch because i just see kind of like a minefield this week of uh people i don't really want to trust and we'll start in the main event we got nikita krylov taking on ryan superman span minus 170 for krylov plus 145 for span cody take it away so again if you're looking at tape and you're like okay well if this is a striking battle who's the better striker geez it looks like span moves a little bit better a little more athletic nice jab on him you know heavy good style kickboxing and uh, definitely within his own in terms of the grappling like span's a pretty decent grappler as well submission defense doesn't seem to be great but submission offense certainly on the table a guy that's uh you know got skills everywhere it seems like he may be a little bit sharper than krylov everywhere the million dollar question is like, well, can he fight beyond the one round? And that, I don't know, Paul, quite literally all his fights are the first round. The last time he exited the first round was 2020, so almost three years ago now, because he has Sam Alvey. <clears throat> and as soon as the first round ends, you can t- tell the wheels fall apart almost instantaneously. So super skilled, got skills everywhere. But this is a five round fight. And Krylov doesn't got a great gas tank either, but what he has shown is he can fight later into the fights. Tired or not, he'll try to get a takedown. Tired or not, he'll come forward and try to throw something. So even though I feel like Span's a little more refined, I feel like the fact that it's a five-round fight especially, it's got to play towards Krylov. Krylov is kind of, I wouldn't say the total package, but starts off as a striker at heavyweight in the UFC. You know, since then comes down to 205 and known as a first-round killer-be-killed type guy himself, right? All of his early fights, all first-round finishes. Can the guy fight, fight beyond a round? Probably not. That's kind of the knock on him. But at some point, he realizes, probably maturity in the sport, he's got tons of pro fights, he realizes, I got to throw other wrinkles to my game, and just adds that wrestling. You go back to the Johnny Walker fight, it's probably the first one that he really starts to show you that development in his game. And since then, he tries to mix it in pretty much all of his spots. Now, should he have mixed it against Paul Craig? No, no. Shouldn't have used it in that spot. But again, you look at that Volkan Uzdemir fight, I'm presented with a heavy hitter, who's a good striker, might be able to clip him, and uh, what do you do? You, you spring the table on him. You use that wrestling. Did he look good against Volkan Uzmir? I didn't think he looked all that good, but it's a grueling type fight. They're big guys. He's continuously pushing for takedowns. He's continuously tr- uh, controlling him. And even standing as he tires out Volkan Uzmir, then he can open up a little bit. So I think he eventually breaks down Span and gets him, uses his takedowns. Even if he doesn't get them immediately, use them to just wear on him, take him maybe to that over one and a half. And then once Span gets tired, should be Krylov live. If he gets on top of him, Span's tired. Span gives up the takedown or uh, the the submission. Stand up. I don't know that TKOs him, but again, if Krylov can swarm him and take him down, ground him, pound him, maybe force a stoppage that way, uh, I feel like it's going to be an inside the distance fight towards Nikita Krylov using that wrestling. So that'll be the pick. Do I feel great about it? No. Would I put it at the top this week and then use it as a hedge out? Also, no. I think that there's other spots I'd rather use, but uh, Krylov will be on the ticket at some point. Yeah, my my only I agree with most of the stuff that you said. There, my only like gripe, my only issue that I have with it is is it's the Paul Craig fight where it's just like you didn't have to go to the ground with Paul Craig. You went to the only place that you can lose against Paul Craig, and 
You know, once once you kind of lose your trust, it's tough to lay the minus 170. I'll be picking Krylov with you, but and I I agree. Like against Uzdemir, he fought really really smart. He obviously blew Alexander Gustafsson completely out of the water. Um, you know, the ghost of Alexander Gustafsson. Yeah, every, everybody's been doing that. <laughs> yeah, but uh, that's my like early early in the fight. That is my one worry is that like Span has a pretty decent submission game. Krylov could get himself into trouble because he did it against the one guy that you don't do that to. Um, but yeah, pick pick his Krylov for me as well. Moving on down, we've got uh, Andre Muniz taking on Brandon Allen. Muniz, a minus 240 favorite. Allen can be had for plus 200. I mean, pretty clear what it is here. If Brandon Allen can keep the fight standing, he should have a significant advantage on the feet. Muniz is pretty solid at wrestling and world-class jiu-jitsu. If he gets the fight down to the mat, which he is wont to do, um, he's either A, going to absolutely dominate you positionally, or he'll find the submission. Against Uriah Hall, he wasn't able to pull that off, um, which I think surprised a lot of people. Tons of people were holding Muniz by sub-tickets in that spot. Um I think he probably gets him down and, and, and finds that submission against Brendan Allen. He's going to have to be very, very desperate to find those takedowns. And in fairness to Uriah Hall, Uriah Hall's you know a real, a real pro in the game, a guy who's been around for a long time. Um, he's seen all. Of, I suppose he's seen all of those looks. He was able to survive some really tight spots. Um, I'll, I'll be picking Muniz. I'll be picking Muniz to win by sub. I don't know if I'm going to get to it from a betting perspective. What about you? Yeah, so last week's card, part of the reason what we did so good is there was no, like, apple pie shitter. Like, there was no real underdog. The underdogs that we did hit on our ticket were, like, Jamal Emmers and... Uh, who's the... Uh, Prakniam, Marcin Prakniam. So, mm-hmm. like, they were they were small, little underdogs. Technically, Blanchfield hit as an underdog, not for us, but, again, a small, little underdog. But for the most part, like, what was supposed to happen, happened, right? And on this week's card, for the most part, I think what's supposed to happen is going to happen. This is the one spot where I think, like, a sizable enough underdog plus 175 range guy for Brandon Allen um, could potentially come through. So I'm going to go ahead and take Brandon Allen. It's not that he Muniz. Uh, in high likelihood, he probably does go out and win this fight, takes his back, controls position, locks down two of the three rounds and gets the job done. I just feel like Brandon Allen's live here. So here's a guy that hasn't been submitted in... You know, almost seven years. It was like his third pro fight. He got subbed. Outside of that, he's fought some decent grapplers. And I think his submission defense is checking up. He's like 27 years old. He's continuously getting better. He's continuously adding wrinkles to his game. But it's that like submission defense, right? Like you said, if he can keep the fight standing, he's going to box him up. No doubt. He's a better striker. He's got boxing combinations. He's got a decent jab, decent leg kicks. He's had a kill cliff FC. Uh, He's got great training partners around him. I think if the fight stays standing, he beats Andre Mooney's up. Sure. It's that transition. Like, what if he can stuff those takedowns? Now, what if he can't stuff those takedowns, but he can still be the one doing the damage? So you go back to the Jacob Malkoon fight, and it's debated, like, did he win that Malkoon fight? I had him bet, so I'm glad he did. But Jacob Malkoon lost his UFC debut in, like, 17 seconds. He got sparked. And since then, he's had four UFC fights. He's completed 30 takedowns in those four UFC fights. The only guy to beat him, because he's 3-1 in those four, is Brandon Allen. He gives up seven takedowns to Jacob Malkoon, but continuously working, continuously landing those short shots and getting back up. And Malkoon's one of the more prolific takedown artists here. Andre Muniz is not. Yeah, he takes down Uriah Hall, but most of it's just like positional. You know, oh, I was able to sling to his back and I'm able to hold on to him. Over 10 minutes of control time in that fight with the three takedowns. So like once he got them, Uriah Hall didn't present anything. Whereas I think with Allen, if you do take him down, going to try to work back up. If you don't take him down up against the cage, small little elbows, small little knees to the thigh, small little knees to the body, continuously working. He learned a lot from that Malkoon fight because it's a dirty, greasy 15-minute fight where it zaps all your energy. And since then, you're just seeing like a more mature version of him. So him at his best, he shows you good wrinkles. He shows you that he's got good striking. He shows you that his rear naked joke's nasty. He has a developed ground game offensively. Defensively, hasn't been submitted in over six years. All good stuff. But again, I go back to the fact that he's young, out of a great gym, and he has the tools to either stuff the takedowns or just judges like to see activity and work. So when you look at Muniz, the last fight, Uriah Hall, great example. Okay, he wins it, unanimous decision. He lands 17 significant strikes. Ooh, not a whole lot. Well, what about the other time he went to decision? His fight with Antonio Arroyo. He wins a decision. He lands 22 significant strikes. Got outstruck 29-22 in that fight. But he got the takedowns. He gets the fight, right? 
there's not a whole lot out of him. So I think with Allen, that volume and that sheer staying busy, even if he's on his back, continuously trying to work your way back up, throw the elbows, get back up, and then try to land whatever you can. I feel like he could grease this one on the scorecards. So wh- wh- why not give me some? You think Muniz is a great jiu-jitsu guy, no doubt, but Allen's got great training partners. Like, I don't know that you can replicate necessarily Andre Muniz snapping your arm in half, but I feel like he's going to be prepared, young, getting better style that could make this one happen i'm hoping he just outworks him and greases him on the scorecard so i'm gonna go with brandon allen all right um yeah a lot, a lot of good points that you made there i mean the, the my he hasn't really taken on somebody in a long time with this level of jujitsu like malcoon can't finish a sandwich puna can't grapple uh, sam alvey can't grapple christoph jocko is like a jack of all trades master of none Carl Roberson, like, yeah, we'll see the improvements. Yeah, as I kind of said, at the, at this price and like those sub props and even like sub one, like they're all pretty pretty short. So it's like it's really tough to make money on Muniz. Don't hate your Brandon Allen call. Um, I'll be picking Muniz, but you make some good points there. All right, moving on down, we got Augusto Sakai taking on Dante Elmez plus one fifteen for Dante Elmez as the underdog. Favorite Augusto Sakai can be had for minus 135. What's your take here? Well, I thought about an underdog shot here on Dante Mays, but after that last fight, like I don't think you could ever bet him ever again. No. And I don't care that uh, Handy Abdelwab got a three-year suspension for being on a pile of steroids. He's still not good. He's still not good. And Dante Mays just showed you that like he, he operates at a very, very low level. Now, six foot six, long-ass reach on him like decent boxing from the outside if he can just stick a move and pot shot you but he doesn't fight good game plans he doesn't cut off the like uh, not cut off the cage sorry he, he doesn't like fight off his back foot particularly well he can't matter to his opponents he gave up a knockdown early in that fight completely rocked by a guy that had no significant training experience just a, a whole lot of gack in his veins and then even as the fight progressed it was just like listen man you may have edged him on the second you need to pull this thing forward in the third gives up a takedown just settles for position he's a bad heavyweight he's a bad heavyweight you would need a lot more plus money to be like yeah i'm taking that shot on him so as much as i don't like augusto sakai and i see a clear path here for mace to win on the outside just outwork him yeah i don't know man i just can't really pull the trigger on him so what's wrong with sakai sakai 31 years old for a heavyweight that's still a baby he could be getting better he just appears to not be getting better at all going back to the alistair overeem he's headlining it's a great spot for him he's fighting one of the best ever former ufc title challenger former world champion outside of the UFC, still to this day one of the best heavyweights. It's probably, you know, grace the cage, top 10 heavyweight all time. Yeah, man, that's a tough go, but he looks decent early. He's got combination boxing. He wins the early rounds against him. It's a five-round fight. The longer it goes, he gets tired, he gets taken down, he gets smashed. There's nothing to be ashamed of. It's that he's done nothing to come back from that. UFC's matched him stiff. They gave him Yerazino Rosenstruck in his next fight. He doesn't really want to engage him. Who would want to engage him with uh, you know, that kind of power? And then Rosenstruck clips him and knocks him out. Tough. How do you rebound from that? They give you Tai Tuivasa, a guy that's ranked in the top five, top seven, challenged for an interim title, kind of like one of those guys that's near the top of the mountain, and it hits like an absolute banjo. So that, is this a great comeback fight on a two-fight losing streak for Sakai? No. And he gets caught. But see, in that fight, he's very tentative. Like, he doesn't even want to engage him. doesn't let his hands go. He's got no offensive wrestling. He's just like a punching bag. He's just standing there and allowing it to happen. And then UFC says, dude, we're sorry. Three-fight losing streak now. You fought all guys that are ranked, all guys that are like very respectable, Rosenstruck, Overeem, and Tai Tuivasa. All apologies. Why don't you take on Sergey Spivak? Like, what world do we live in, man? This guy's manager is doing him no favors. And what do you think happens? Well, he gives up six takedowns and absolutely gets smashed by Sergey Spivak. Understandable. So part of me wants to give him the benefit of the doubt. Back class, okay? He's fought in the best guys. He comes up short against them. So he should be able to smash a step down like Mays. The other problem is, though, when you analyze the fights, he's just not doing anything. He just stands there. He stands there and he just he allows his opponents to go first. And this is a small cage, so maybe he can cut off the ring. Maybe he can force the clinch. Maybe he tries to wrestle, which he never seems to ever do, but like maybe he does in this spot. I don't know. But if he allows himself to just be complacent, Maze is just going to dance around the perimeter and, 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 and like long rangey kicks and jabs and outwork them. So I can see the underdog squeezing it out. It's a greasy heavyweight fight. This one very much is a greasy heavyweight fight. 
But uh, yeah, I mean, I, Maze let me down so hard his last time. He's on my top ticket. He's on my top ticket. He's fighting the worst guy the UFC signed to their heavyweight roster in a long time and bummed it. And by the way, the U- betting, uh, like your bookie, they don't care that the other guy tests positive for steroids six months later. <laughs> your money's gone. So, yeah. yeah, Maze is pretty much dead to me. For that reason and that reason alone, the pick will still be Sakai, but uh, low, low down the priority list this week, Paul. Yeah, my bigger concern with Augusto Sakai is, like, if D1 Dontale uh, shows up like he did in his previous fight before, handy anal swab, absolutely. Like, I had all of the CLV there. H- handy anal swab absolutely just 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 torqued me. It was brutal. But yeah, D1 Dontail was like grabbing grabbing the clinch and then getting like trips multiple times over and over and over against Josh Parisian in that fight. That is my concern here, like and, and why I don't really want to back Augusto Sakai on a four fight losing streak. But yeah, you said it all. It's like Augusto Sakai has been fighting much, much better competition. We're getting close pick 'em price here. I think he's a much better technical striker. Uh, my only concern is that I really don't think he can wrestle. I think the more uh, natural, strong heavyweight is Dante Mays. Um, Sakai kind of just, I don't know. We'll see how he looks uh, this week on the scales. 31 years old, heavyweight, still a baby. I mean, people thought that uh, Tai Tuivasa was completely done, and then he he had a run towards the title. So, like, uh, he's still a baby at heavyweight. He showed some real promise early on in his run, and this is a – if you can't beat Dante Mays, you don't belong here anymore. So Sakai is the pick here. Um, moving on down, we've got the people's main event. The queen has returned, Cody. Tatiana Suarez takes on Montana De La Rosa. Suarez, minus 800 favorite. Montana De, De La Rosa can be had for plus 150. I mean, it feels I, – I almost kind of, like, lost faith. I didn't know if she was ever going to come back. She had, obviously, neck injuries and, ton, like, a ton of injuries. But at her best, Tatiana Suarez was the best woman at 115 pounds. And, I mean, she showed that against Carla Esparza, absolutely just flatlining the – like, who became the champion of the division, making it look absolutely easy. Nina Ansarov fight wasn't exactly her best performance, but she still pulled it out. Um, and I think she was dealing with those injuries at that point. Now she's gone for, what, three years? Returning here against an opponent that I really don't think poses too many problems. Um, Montana De La Rosa probably wins like a striking matchup between the two of them. But good luck not getting taken down by Tatiana Suarez. She's got decent grappling, Montana De La Rosa, but there is levels to this game. And Suarez is the GOAT when it comes to women's wrestling in MMA. Um, the biggest question mark is, they, well, they got a minus 800 price tag on Suarez. And she's been off for all this time with serious injuries. So there are there are some concerns there. My struggle with how to approach this from a betting perspective is like, do I want to, do I think it goes to decision? Montana De La Rosa, incredibly, incredibly durable. I see a lot of people, there was like a plus 160 out there on Suarez inside the distance. That's been slashed down to like plus 110 at most places now. It feels kind of 50-50 whether she gets the decision or the, or the, or the finish to me. I'll be watching from a distance on prize picks, promo code DOP. They've got uh, fantasy points. I think that's the angle here. Um, 92.5. She can get there in a lot of different ways. She either gets a finish in the first couple of rounds or she just racks up tons of submission attempts, takedowns, yada, yada, yada. In a decision, she could get over 92.5. I was expecting that to be at least 100 um, on prize picks. So that's my favorite prize picks play this week. Interested to hear what you have to say about uh, the return of the queen and how you're attacking this fight. Yeah, well, how do I attack it? It's just parlay material, but not top ticket, probably second ticket, because again, it's minus 800, so there's no real value that you can put parlaying it with one other fighter, and she's been off for three years. She's had, you know, big-time injuries that she's had to work through. She's 32 years old coming back to the sport, and it's not like Montana De La Rosa is a complete walkover, so in terms of putting her on parlays, like once you get to six, seven, eight fight parlays, she'll add some type of value, but until then, there's just not a whole lot of meat on the bone. In terms of how do you attack it for the parlay standpoint, or so the... Uh, the prop standpoint, 
I'm see prime Tatiana Suarez. I think she gets her out of there. Like she stopped Carlos Esparza late in the third round. Um, just ground and pounds her out of there. She's pretty like got a decent pace. She's able to just overcome and just maul opponents, break them down, right? But again, in her last fight against Nina Ansaroff, I think the injuries are definitely paramount. She's slowing down. She doesn't really look all that comfortable. She's okay with just letting time click by the clock. So coming back three years later, I think that she'll probably go with the conservative approach and not just try to have this big, big performance. But again, at 32, being off for three years, you're one or two wins away from a title shot. And because your body's not probably going to hold up in the long run, she needs that title shot sooner rather than mm -hmm. later. So she wants a big statement performance. She, she goes out there and she attacks Montana De La Rosa. Then it's going to pose question marks on, does she tire out the lawyer it goes? Does she, does she give her some opportunity? Does she just wreck her and then you hit an inside the distance all day long? Or does she go with that just, I'll dominate in the wrestling? And with Montana De La Rosa, she has a 63% takedown defense in the UFC, which is effectively 37% too little. <laughs> like you're going to be up Shit's Creek when she gets shooting the takedowns. And I think that's probably going to be the story of it. Now, her jiu-jitsu is good. I see her throwing up submissions. But uh, beyond that, I think that uh, she's just going to get largely controlled for the most part, two of the three rounds. And if for whatever reason, in the last round, Suarez doesn't want to wrestle or Suarez's knees hurt, whatever the case may be, once you're up two rounds, I think it's going to be a case of just hold on, you know, wait for the, the time to expire and then take home that decision. So a minus 800, you would expect a walk in the park. And you would also expect this is definitely a top ticket play. But being that it's women's MMA, very unpredictable. Being that it's three year long layoff because of a couple massive injuries, 32, not old, not young. Yeah, enough red flags to kind of give you a nervous feeling about it. So let's just move on from this one. The pick is Suarez. But to answer your question on how do I attack it, I think I'm going to go the decision route and mm -hmm. say that she just wins two of those three rounds and then plays it cool. Once you've now tested the knee, once you feel good, once you've now reintroduced yourself to the division, go after the big fish then. Yeah. And I mean, I think, and that's my, my thing with this fight is that like her inside the distance is plus, or yeah, plus 110. Her winning by decision is minus one twenty. It's like they've they've cornered the market. Um, that it is seems pretty fifty fifty. We seem pretty torn. Like I wouldn't be shocked if she goes out there and absolutely flatlines her. But I also, you know, Montana De La Rosa has been really, really, really durable. Um, a lot of it probably comes down to who's refing that night and what type of mood they're in and whether they let things go. And it's not really a spot that I think I have, like, you know, a mathematical edge on it. So I'll be very, very happy to see her come away victorious. I just don't know if I'm going to be putting money, my money where my mouth is. We'll see as the week goes on. Maybe maybe I'll see something, hear something. I don't know. But uh, for, for now, I'll just sit back and, and enjoy the show. All right, we got uh, Mike Malott taking on Johan Lines. Mike Malott, a minus 210 favorite. Lines can be had for plus 180. Canada on Canada violence. Cody, who you got? Yeah, interesting that they would match the two Canadians with each other. But but all the same, like, I get it. I just don't know the real rhyme reasoning. But, uh, yeah, we got bragging rights on top of just a regular old scrap. But with Johan Lines, extremely strong. One of these guys that on the Canadian regional scene, raw, but... Uh, Got a big old hook on him, and eventually if he connects, he's going to give you problems. You see him in a lot of bad spots, but he just eventually breaks down his opponent. Cardio, eh, not so good, but a wild man. Gets on Contender Series, I've got low expectations for him, and what do you know? He goes out there and he delivers the goods. He's like a massive underdog, but he, he's, got, he's got big power. He's probably one of these one-round guys. In his Evan Cutts fight, he shows, like, I think it's a second-round finish, but he's completely gassed out. Cardio is an issue for him. BJJ Brown Belt, I believe, under Fabio Holanda in the BTT Canada system, but not known for his ground game for the most part. Just one of these one-round guys that's going to be fun, entertaining, take you out. Uh, runs into Gabe Green in his second fight, and you, you pretty much exactly see that. So Gabe Green is just super durable, right? I mean, the guy can take a hell of a punch and then keeps coming at you. So Lioness's regular old game plan of knocking guys out almost works. Like, he floors them with a big old shot. Gabe Green hits the deck, springs right back up, starts putting pressure on him, and then by the end of that round, maybe a minute after he scored a clean knockdown, he himself's exhausted. Gabe Green pulls over and eventually finishes him late in the second round. So I think that was the moment where it was like, you knew it was a buildup. He looks like he's got suspect cardio, but everybody he runs into, he's been knocking out in the first round. So the first time he really got extended, yeah, he completely fall, fell apart. Now, Darian Weeks, his last time out, 
he decides to conserve himself. You know, you know what? I'm not going to fight the same way I normally do and just try to get that first round knockout. I'm going to try to hold back, maybe try to grapple a little bit. I didn't think he looked good whatsoever. He squeaks out a split decision. Uh, he gave up the takedown. He got outstruck. I just didn't think he looked good at all. So, so it's the, you know, damned if you do, damned if you don't. If he goes after that kill, fights at him at his best, you know, then he's gassed out after a round. He's no good. If he conserves himself and doesn't go for it, then he, there's just not enough offense out of him. So it's hard to really get behind Johan Lioness. And in this fight, in this fight, especially with Mike Malott, I think Mike Malott's got him beat absolutely everywhere. The one thing, one thing. So Malott does show on his record like he did get knocked out by Hakeem Duadu, who, in retrospect, fights at 145 pounds, right? His fight with Thomas Diang in Bellator, he wins the first two rounds. And then, in, sorry, in the first round, he wins a 10-8. Second and third round, he he gasses out he takes a lot of damage in that fight he takes a long layoff from the sport he comes back you see him get hurt in some of these fights and he's able to come back in fact watch the tape on him it's like a lot of these shots are stinging him and then if he can get the fight to the ground he's got one hell of a ground game because he had gone through some medical issues and he had taken some time away from the sport but similar to like a well i don't know what tatiana suarez is up to but it's not just like oh they've just been off for three years like in his case he focused on well let's not get punched in the head Let's just work on jiu-jitsu. And his grab game got really good. He ended up being one of the head coaches at Team Alpha Male over in Sacramento. Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt, competitive black belt, and does quite well for himself. So if this fight hits the ground with Johan Lioness, he's got him done. If the fight stays standing, he's a lot more athletic. He's got better footwork. He's a rangier attacker. That did not convince that his chin is bulletproof. I'm not convinced that he's not one of these guys that could not just get caught by a shot and not recover from it. So Johan Lioness, kind of like the only thing about him, heavy-handed. Mike Malott, like the only chink in his armor, chin might not that be that good. The rest of his skills are great. Durability still kind of in question. So that's like the only little bit of hesitancy on like why not put Mike Malott right at the top. But he's going to be near the top. I think he's got him beat everywhere. I think he's a better striker than him. He's a better grappler than him. He's got better cardio than him. I think he's more experienced than him. I, I think he's got him beat everywhere. But of course, this is MMA. The sport of punchy kicky only takes one. And it's not like Mike Malott's Oh, I can't even compare him to Nate Landwehr because Nate Landwehr got knocked out on me one time against Gilbert Burns' bum-ass brother Herbert. So it can literally happen to anybody. And so, you know, always when you're gambling, buyer beware, sure. But outside of that, I think Malat takes this one handedly. Yeah, I, I don't really have anything to add to that. Um, pretty skill for skill, it's not even remotely close. It's it's MMA, small cage at the apex. Lioness could absolutely crack him and, and get a knockout. I think the line is probably pretty accurate. And not something that I feel too, too confident in either way. I think Mike Malott absolutely wins, but yeah, there's enough doubt at the prices and like what's what's Lioness by knockout is plus 350. If you're gonna bet him. That's how you're. That's how you do it. If you're gonna, if you're gonna take decision. that shot, and we'll he's see. not scoring a submission. So yeah, we'll see how weigh and shake out, and uh, if anything changes over the course of the week. But I'm with you. I think skill for skill, it's not even remotely close. But the one question, the one thing Lines can do well is you know land a heater and knock you out. And the one thing, the one problem that Mike Malott has had is uh, some durability. Here's a banger. Is Trevor Peak, uh, Trevor Peak Fight Week, as uh, as you aptly said before we jumped on the show here. Trevor Peak, Cody's boy, minus 210, taking on Eric Gonzalez, who can be had for plus 180. The under in this is absolutely juiced to the max, um, as it should be. If you saw Trevor Peak's Contender Series fight, what a banger. <laughs> um, he, he took some shots himself there, but he showed an absolute warrior spirit. Hell of a performance. I think I actually hit him live. He was like plus like 400 live as I, as the tides were turning. Like he basically Homer Simpson, that other dude. Um, it was great. He showed like that's the kind of guy I like to back because, you know, even if things are looking poorly, you know, he's not quitting on himself. So I'm sure you, as somebody who actually knows him personally, felt really, really good for him. Um, nobody came here to listen to me talk about Trevor Peak fight week. Uh, what do you think about your guys' matchup this week? 
Yeah, well, I didn't like to see him take that much damage because Malik Lewis definitely put it on him. But yeah, I think that's that's what you're trying to bet on. That's what Trevor Pete can do that Mike Malott can't do is that he might get absolutely wrecked for a period of time, uh, but the goal remains the same. It's like he's conscious the whole way through. He's going to fight his whole, whole way through. So, you know, part of matchmaking is at the amateur level, professional level, doesn't matter, is that you're going to deal with like a wide variety of fighters and di- guys have different mindsets and different goals and different aspirations, especially at amateur where you could be, you know, a bus driver and it's like, I got to go back to school on Monday or I got something I got to do, right? So what I've noticed is that there's like three categories of guys. There's guys that have come to the fight and they're ready to compete, right? And there's guys that come and they're ready to fight. They're going to do the dirty if they need to be. And then there's that like small subgroup of guys they come ready to die. Trevor Peak, he fits that mold, man. He's an absolute junkyard dog. This is a sport where that term gets thrown around lots, but now he very much is that. He just doesn't know any better. Now, he has a late start to MMA because he's getting in trouble with the law and he's hooked on drugs and he just doesn't really find himself. So, like, not a guy that wrestled in high school, not a guy that wrestled in college, not a guy that comes from any type of boxing background. He literally has no martial arts skills other than the fact that he's, like, a tough guy, guy with a desire trains out of his garage for like the vast majority, actually the entirety of his amateur career. Um, And then even like into a bit of his pro career, he's basically just training himself with the desire of, I want to do this. And generally in his fights, they get really sloppy and he gets tired, but he pushes through. And like, that's the X factor with Trevor Peak is that he just keeps going. And I think that will, once he's surrounded himself with the right group of people, it's like they can channel that. He's got the aggression. He's got the heart. He's got the durability. He's got some decent athleticism. Like, the guy's put together quite well. It's a matter of, like, are you going to give him the actual fighting skills? So he's over at a Gogi now in Tennessee, and I think that that's exactly what they're doing. They're giving him those skills. So you see a lot of progression from him fight to fight. He's getting better fight to fight. He's making those improvements fight to fight. And uh, it it culminates actually right before the Malik Lewis fight. He fought Kama Worthy. So Kama Worthy is a UFC veteran. Kama Worthy is a guy that beat Luis Pena in the UFC. You know, he's got BJJ Brown Belt, solid grappling, right? Very good striking, Muay Thai stance. Not any real durability. And then so it's another one of those fights where it's like the the, the best thing about Trevor Peak, right? Which is that that dog effect, which is that durability is the worst thing about Kama Worthy where he's super skilled but doesn't have that durability. So... That's a tough fight for Peak, and he definitely takes some damage early in him. But the longer it goes, it's like he eventually catches him. Thing is, he got caught a lot in that fight. And then they tell him it's a month later. It's one month to the day. It's four weeks after he fights Calm and Worthy. He got hit a bunch in that fight. Leg got chewed up in that fight. Four weeks later, he now has to take on Malik Lewis, who for the record was huge. So whatever you saw in that Malik Lewis fight, you saw, you know, that heart. That's basically the biggest thing he put on is like now with a full camp. And now with five months, five months later, you're just going to continuously see a better version of himself because now he's getting paid. Now he's got a little bit of money. Now that now he's motivated. He's got a goal. He's in the world's biggest promotion. He's going to have like more tools and more resources to his disposal. So I'm really excited to see this version of Trevor Peak, and I'm hoping to get back down. Well, I'm going to Nashville March, March 5th, but uh, then I'm hoping to go see Trevor at the next Aries card down probably like June, June, July over in Nashville. So yeah, I wish I could make it to this one live. Unfortunately, I can't, but I know Trevor Peak's going to go there, down there and, and do the damn thing. Going to the Malink Lewis fight, though, just before we switch over to Eric Gonzalez and why he's a dead man. But uh, Malink Lewis <laughs> is super tall. Like He's a really tall guy, and he fights rangy. So Peak looked, I, in my opinion, not very good in that fight. Like He fights way too far out. He's swinging way too far out. Again, he doesn't know how to use his feet quite yet to set up those shots, to kind of cut off the angle and set the guy up into the power shot. So it's a lot of him swinging from the outside. Uh, him with a shorter guy in Eric Gonzalez, I feel like he's going to find that target and break on through. And Gonzalez, like all the credit to him, but one, he's coming in on relatively short notice here. And uh, so I, not really, he was going to fight Darius Flowers. I think they both had opponents uh, fall out and this fight got matched up. But yeah, I mean, I, I'm not seeing it out of him. On the regional scene, he wasn't really... And he's just not only good. He doesn't really have wrestling that he can go to. Taking down Trevor Peak would be a problem, even if you were able to manage to take him down, which, again, at his strength and his physicality, going to be a problem. His get-up game is going to be pretty solid here because I think of that strength disparity. Once he gets back up, I think Peak's just going to walk through anything Gonzalez has. He's not one for combination punching, but even if he does let up his hands, it's going to set up that counter for Trevor Peak. He doesn't fight particularly good off his back foot. He's been off for a decent amount of time. He's had enough fights where it's like you should see that improvements out of him. And yeah, I just don't. His Jim Miller fight knocked out in the second round. Uh, 
striking defense, not all that good. This fight with Terrence McKinney, non-competitive, subbed early in the first round. Trevor Peak, technically VJJ white belt, but deceiving. Like, he's super strong. He can pick up guys and slam them, watch that worthy fight, almost deads him off a slam. But eventually, again, his ground game's improving. Eventually, he's going to get into a position where he can snatch something up. And he'll be one of those guys that if he grabs you in a rear naked choke, there's no fight in the hands. Like, he's just going to he's gonna put you out cold. He's too strong for you. And But I think this one's going to come down to the knockout. Peak backs him up, lands that big right hand over the top. And I really appreciate that the UFC has given him, like, not the easy route. This is a fight. They're all tough. They're all competitive. Gonzalez is in a walk in the park. Minus 210, you know, still competitive enough. But uh, Trevor Peake's a guy that you're going to have to slowly give him better and better guys every time out and allow him to get better with the competition, not just throw him to some Russian dude who's been fighting his whole life. And this is this is a good first fight for him. So, unfortunately, Gonzalez just doesn't have the wrestling to take Peake down and take him out of his element. And I don't think he's going to just matador him and counterpunch for 15 minutes. So, Peak at some point finds the money shot and then uh, puts him away. Let's go, Trevor Peak. Let's Hope, go for for your for your sake. Um, yeah, there was a lot of things to be a little bit worried about. Yeah, but he was taking on a guy who's super super tall. Um, he seemed a little bit out of his element early, but like those are the types of guys I like to back. And I think he's probably getting a nice little matchup here because, let's face it, a guy like this is the type of guy that the UFC likes to have on cards because whether they have you know a lot of marquee names at the top of it it's like you know trevor peak's gonna show up and uh and put on a show which brings me to like I, the one thing i just wanted to say is just like jordan wright versus zach palga it's just like i feel like zach palga should get cut for what he did there um one if that if that fight is in a i, I had nothing on it like whatever um I, I didn't even fall for the for the under trap on it. I didn't even fall oh, for the, the under, under trap yeah, on it. No, like I, no, I had learned my lesson the previous time um, with that. But it's just like if you make a Jordan Wright fight not entertaining, like you got to go. Um, a whole standing cage control. Uh, I was talking to one guy in the DMs about about it. It's just like that's the thing with a lot of these Apex cards too and you have to kind of factor that in. If that's in front of 15,000, 20,000 fans, the amount of booing that would be going on during that fight, the ref would step in at some point just from like the pressure of, you know, 15,000 people booing what's going on in the cage. When you're in the Apex, you know, the fans that are there are probably too scared to do any booing because if you're if you're booing them well that guy may see you out back there's only like 30 <laughs> 35 50 people in the venue at that time um i think there was a lot of state standing cage control that in a different venue but you got to kind of factor into like any of these apex fights um that would not probably have if they're at the o2 in london everyone's losing their mind and jordan wright is a is patty pimblett he's a he's a british guy that everyone's cheering for do you think that they let him have like four five or four and a half i think it was like nine minutes of standing cage control over the course of 15 like that doesn't happen so that's definitely something that's a little bit different when they're at the apex in my humble opinion it's like the ufc has got to get out of the apex um these cards are like you know they, they feel kind of just like filler in general and it's just like they're obviously it's a lot cheaper for them to run them this way but it's like the big event, the big, the feel, the sound of the crowd. It's like, that's what we're like. This was fine during the pandemic, but it's like, it feels like the UFC really has to get on the road. Cause like a lot of these apex cards is just, I love MMA. I'm going to tune into every single one of them, but it's just like, it's just not as fun. If does that make any sense to you? Do you agree with me? Do you, you disagree you, with me? A hundred percent, man. And to like to further your point, so Trevor Peak is from Pisgah, Alabama, right? And then when he fights in Tennessee, the whole town comes. He might have a thousand people come to see him. He's like the beloved child, right? And uh, there's a whole lot of support. So believe me, when you go to his fights live. It's ruckus, man. And if you land something, the place goes wild. You feed into it. You feed off the energy of the crowd. When he fought in the Apex, would have been like the first time in his career where he fought in like an absolute... I mean, yeah, you fight on some lower level amateur shows uh, on your way up through the ranks here and there. But for the most part, like the Apex is going to be the smallest, most private atmosphere you're ever going to fight in. So he mentioned afterwards, he's like, it was really hard to like 
get going because you're so used to this crowd and feeding off the energy that now it's just like normally the fight's going on and all you hear is like just from, just from like that the the atmosphere and the noise now it you have to get punched in the face 30 times to hear and that's when he turns off that's when he was like oh, oh i gotta start fighting and as soon as trevor peak started fighting it was game over so I, yeah like you're saying i think for the audience and this and that it affects stuff for the judges i think it affects stuff for people thought greg jackson was bad before when he'd be like oh you definitely won the round oh that was an easy round cup cup you won that round you definitely these judges know you won that round it's like shut up greg couldn't hear him as good now it's the apex you hear everything it's easy to persuade the judges you hear the the you know the clap off that kick and it's oh man that that's the acoustics it sounds more like maybe it's persuading the judging maybe it's persuading you know the the fighting maybe it's persuading the the viewership at home i don't know but definitely fighting in larger venues and feeling that atmosphere yeah that's where it's at unfortunately it's not feasible man they have like hundreds and hundreds of fighters on their roster thousand fighters on the roster they have a hundred events a year basically and you mentioned that like oh in the apex you might run into this guy you know outside that's like the t-mobile didn't johnny walker have to like walk home <laughs> like these guys are just they're everywhere there's so many fighters now that what again this goes back to what i appreciate about this matchmaking here for peak you sign him you give him the contract apparently he went to the hospital with a broken jaw didn't break his jaw took a lot of shots right they took him to the hospital to make sure that he got checked out and everything was good he was good now it's like okay who do you who do you match him up with it's like alex reyes alex reyes he hasn't fought in six years he's had one fight in the ufc he lasted a minute and 19 against Mike Perry, who kneed him in the face and KO'd him. He hasn't been outside of round one in eight years because he's kind of a fast finisher himself. Well, he's ho he's uh, Dominic Reyes' brother, but like that's his claim to fame. Outside of that, his own career, not very prolific. How did you draw up this name? And then he f pulls out, surprise, surprise, and to like go and move on from that and get him uh, a, a you know pretty much an equal level of opponent, slightly maybe better than Eric Gonzalez, slightly worse than Eric Gonzalez, doesn't really matter. That's that's cool, man. Because there's just a lot of guys that right now are going to be stylistical nightmares from them. But but this goes back to your point about Jordan Wright. Give these action fighters action fights. Why would you want a guy that's just going to kick him in the leg from the outside all night? Why would you want you know a guy that's just going to take him down and dominate him? If he goes on a six fight winning streak and he's eventually going to have to contend with the top ten, top five guys, then he'll fight a wrestler eventually. But at the lower level, give the fans the entertaining fight. So I think that's what this one's going to be. And Trevor Peak wins the entertaining fight. The chess match of a fight, he'll win eventually, right? But right now, if you want to play checkers with him, good luck, pal. Yeah. All right. Let's move on to the rest of the fights here. We got uh, Gabriela Fernandez taking on Jasmine Jasudovicious. Minus 130 for Fernandez. Plus 110 for Double J. What's your take here, bud? Well, I could be offside on this one, but I'll go with another Canadian selection here in Jasmine Jasta de Vicia. So uh, she comes from a, again, late starter to the sport of MMA, didn't have any real base. But when she did eventually to start uh, decide to switch over to combat sports, it was wrestling. Like Jasmine can wrestle. I think her at her best is her mixing in that to her game. Now she's willing to come forward and throw hands, but her footwork isn't great quite yet. Defensively, she leaves her head up just a tad bit straight and she's right there to be countered. She wants to throw down. She wants to make it a scrap. And I think that mentality causes you to chase the 50 Gs and it causes you to chase the finish and it causes you to chase that entertaining fight, whereas you're not necessarily playing to the best of your skills. So coming off the loss, I feel like her team would reevaluate and be like, you know what? We need to mix that wrestling into your game. Now, in her last fight against Natalia Silva, Natalia Silva is pretty dynamic, man. I mean, she moves well laterally. She moves good side to side. She's pretty evasive and she's got nasty kickboxing game, high, high volume. So when the wrestling didn't quite work out, the just scrap mentality didn't really work out either because you were getting out volume to kind of just beat to the punch all around. So that's a tough one against Gabriela Fernandez. Kickboxing could be an issue again. Like I think that she's going to have some slight advantages standing, but the difference is, is that she doesn't seem to have that athleticism. She doesn't seem to move off her back foot and, and strike while moving quite as good. So not only that, but watching tape on her, like I don't know if she's any good on the ground, but I'm leaning towards not great on the ground. Don't think her takedown defense is all that good. I don't think she's got some nasty guard game. I think if Jasmine stays in the pocket, throws a couple shots, but eventually cuts her off and mixes in the grappling, I think she should be able to edge this one out. So uh, sometimes losing is good for a fighter, causes you to go back to the drawing board and prove on those mistakes. 
and her coming out of Niagara Top Team, which is uh, Jim in Niagara Falls, Canada, that's just really churning out top prospects right now. They're all really solid wrestlers, and they're smart, good game plans. Sure to God, the game plan will now be, okay, we know we can strike in the pocket. Let's back her up and let's take her down. Don't let Fernandez just get comfortable with kickboxing from the outside. And I also don't know that Fernandez is going to throw up that near uh, the amount of volume that uh, her last opponent did. So yeah, I, I, I'm thinking Jasmine Jassa DeVicius by decision. And uh, even hearing her interviews this week where she was like, oh, I chased the finish too much. I chased the finish too much. To me, that's like that's been put into her where it's like, Screw the finish. If it comes, it comes. Work for the positional awareness. Work for the scoring points. Work for the get the judge's attention that you are winning, and then finishes will present themselves. So already I feel like the mentality is there for the proper changes, and she's got the skills to do it. So slight underdog, and uh, we're going to need a few of those here and there, but we are going to take the slight underdog price for Jasmine. And I, I, I'm thinking improve it by going with the Jasmine by decision, but why get greedy, right? Yeah, and that's already greased, or it's already over two and a half is minus 275. And she ran into an absolute stud in Natalia Silva, who I think not many people really knew much about her, like myself included. It was really tough to find tape when she was heading into that fight, and she's proven to be one of the rising prospects in the division. So kind of a tough matchup. She'd been off for three years, right? So it was like, oh, well, did she get any better? Oh, yeah, she did. But you don't know that at the time. So for Jazz, what are you getting ready for? What are you preparing for? Whereas I I feel like with Rodriguez, it's like, or sorry, with Fernandez, um, they're going to, they should be able to put it together a lot better. Yeah, I'll I'll pick, I'll pick Jasmine with you. But uh, I vowed after last week, (laughs) I had the over, in uh sorry fight goes to decision in uh muero bueno silva versus uh lena landsberg and you know i was like landsberg's tough she's been around the block she knows how to like survive in some of these submission positions i was a little you know butt was a little bit puckered in round two and she's you know mara bueno silva's got her back she's fighting the hands she's doing everything she's got to do and I'm like, we're going to get, we get to the end of this round three. We've got, you know, five more minutes. We're going to cash this bet. Good times. And then she gets out of trouble and then goes back into trouble. So like, Cody, I'm pre-flop. I'm, I'm just not betting uh, women's MMA um, for a bit. Like, I'll bet it live. But like, and yeah, if I have, I mean, this was Lena Landsberg, a 40, a 40 year old, veteran who's not supposed to make these types of mistakes it's like a pre-flop i'm not i'm not i'm not getting involved um unless it's like unless it's the elite elite the suarez is the uh shevchenko's that type of thing because i just saw like that the the level of fight iq there was just so bad so aggravating like she that 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 ticket was well on its way and i i just have no reason for why she followed it right back to the ground so um, yeah, I'll pick J- double J, but, uh, won't be touching it with my money. We got, uh, Victor Martinez taking on Jordan Levitt. Victor Martinez and Jordan Levitt are at a straight pick em. It's one of those things. I mean, if this fight stays standing, Martinez kind of a brawler, um, walks you down. I don't know if I really love his footwork, but throws a lot of volume. Levitt, on the other hand, I don't think he's the greatest wrestler, when he is able to get people to the ground, he's got solid jujitsu and he's got uh, very, very uh, solid top control. Uh, the re- the real question here, who like Martinez got taken down twice on his contender series fight, he was able to pop back up, which was uh, which is pretty promising, I suppose. This as long as this fight's on the feet, Martinez should land a lot more than Jordan Levitt. I will be picking Martinez, but I am a little bit scared. Um, that Levitt has a very, very significant grappling edge here. What's your take on it? I'm going to go with Levitt, but you're totally right. It's a battle of a striker versus grappler. And unlike Andre Muniz's fight, where it's basically striker versus grappler, I'm going to head the other way here and, and go with Jordan Levitt. Sometimes you don't need to have the best wrestling as long as you have that big, long frame and you're able to just work your way to the back. And he's got a knack for finding the position. Whereas Victor Martinez, I, I, again, it's hard to say how good he'll be when he comes into this fight. He's been fighting professional for 13 years. And he turned pro at like just after his 19th birthday. So he's 20 years old and he's fought kind of sparingly. He's had one fight in the last three years. So 
Has he made improvements? I don't know. How how valuable is the tape watching it? I don't know. But when you watch tape on him, he gives up takedowns fairly easily. He gives up his back fairly easily. And to me, that's going to be a problem. In his contender series fight with Jacob Rosales, he does give up two takedowns. Beyond that, uh, he lands just so much volume. He's got excellent boxing. Like you said, if it doesn't take him down, then I think he's going to have a great shot to just beat him up from the outside. Beat him up from the inside, wherever you want it. Levitt's not a great striker. The Trey Ogden fight, he stayed to the outside and just spam kicks. But against a volume puncher, not going to work. So I feel like Levitt's going to be, you know, kill or be killed here on the basis of getting this fight to the ground. But I, I think he's going to get the fight to the ground. Patty Pimblett, a dude that walks around at 270 pounds. I'm kidding. But you know what I'm saying? Patty Pimblett, uh, big boy for the weight class. You saw his wrestling improved in that fight. He was winning that fight until he eventually made a mistake and allowed Patty the Batty to take over. But Levitt's wrestling, again, it's a work in progress. But because he's willing to shoot the takedown and create the scramble, sometimes he'll just be able to snatch something up on transition, hit a sweep in transition, get on top in transition. And I feel like that will be the key with Martinez, who at least based on prior tape, seems to make mistakes in those tr transitional areas. So, yeah, he probably boxes him up on the feet, but Levitt comes out of syndicate MMA. He works with some of the best guys in in Las Vegas, which are therefore some of the best guys in the world. Um, I, I do see areas to his game that he's improving in. Now, nobody likes to see him twerk after the fight. No one likes to see him, you know, do some flash dance stuff. But, uh, yeah, part of that is it, like, puts pressure on you. It's like, I'm going to go out there and smoke this guy. He's not physically strong. He can't really strike. His wrestling's non-existent. They call him the monkey king because, you know, he's just a squirmy guy with some BJJ. That's fair, but this guy's constantly in, in the gym, constantly improving his skills. And if you're going to make these these slight mistakes in there and, and allow him to win the scrambles, he's going to come out on top. He's going to latch onto the back. He's going to at least either choke you out or, or, or just hold on to it for a couple of rounds and win a decision, so... I, uh, I'm going to lean towards Jordan Levitt to just get those grappling exchanges going at some point and win the fight. All right, we got Charles Johnson taking on O'Day Osborne. Charles Johnson, a minus 150 favorite. Osborne can be had for plus 130. Who you got here, buddy? Yeah, so it feels like O'Day Osborne's a lot more dynamic, and he's got, you know, he's got the range. He's a little more explosive. He's a little faster. But the longer the fight goes, he starts to slow down, and that explosiveness, that uh, that evasiveness, it leaves him fairly quickly. Whereas Charles Johnson, quite the opposite. Good striker as well. But the longer these fights are going is where he's picking up the steam, getting better, improving, and uh, and eventually getting to his opponent. So I feel like that's probably the case here too. You saw with Ode Osborne a lot of these fights. Uh, it was Brian Kelleher fight, I guess he just got subbed really quick. But in his Manel Cop fight, he starts off quite well. He's beaten Cop to the punch. He's fast. His drop to flyweight is definitely prove, uh, you know, proving dividends for him. And then, boom, caught with a nasty shot. You give him the benefit of the doubt. The very next fight was C.J. Vergara. It's the same thing. The first round, he's dominating C.J. Vergara. The second and the third round, the longer it goes... Vergara's putting it on him, and that's a very limited level guy at 125 pounds, getting steam, getting momentum, and damn near stealing the fight on you. Does win it, doesn't look good. Adeshev smokes him in the first round. Tyson Nam, he gets smoked in the first round. So durability might be an issue for him. This is the second time he's been knocked out in the first round in the UFC. I'll give him the benefit of the doubt. Manel Kopp and Tyson Nam, absolute, absolute hammers for 125 pounds. But all the same, knocked out twice in the first round now, and then his wins are when he's able to largely explode in the first round. Beat Vergara by decision, sure, but gassed out. So I'm lean, that's kind of what I'm leaning towards. I'm not sold on his cardio. The cut to 125 being that tall, I think that's taking something out of him. I think him being that lateral, him being that physical, him being that tw fast twitch muscle, he's just not able to properly maintain it. Whereas Charles Johnson, because he's the former LFA champ, he's fighting in these five-round fights. He's used to get going later on as the fight gets going. And I feel like that'll be the difference maker here. Competitive first round. Might even be able to get a good live price on Charles Johnson if he loses the first. Mm -hmm. But second and the third, he figures out Ode Osborne takes it home. Yeah, I generally agree with most of it. I took Flick at like really absurd. I mean, there was the big layoff. I took Flick at like plus 420 on the money line. I think I had a plus, one, uh, plus 385 as well. Um, and yeah, Charles Johnson really covered most of his tracks there. He showed a real complete game. And Ode Osborne last time out, like against Tyson Nam. Just throwing real, like just throwing caution to the wind, looking like a guy who's gonna mean? be knockout or bust, and not somebody that I'm gonna be trusting with my money. So I think the much more technical striker um, here, and the much more the better tactician. Frankly, it's like maybe maybe Ode, he's very very explosive, can catch him with something. But I'm with you. I think 
Charles Johnson is the much, much, much more complete, refined, and trustworthy fighter of the two of them. And uh, minus 150, I may have to get on board with that. Uh, maybe maybe betting live is a better better strategy, though, because O'Day should start pretty hot. He pretty much always does. But uh, Charles Johnson is the pick. Moving on down, we got Joe Selecki, minus 600, taking on Carl Deaton, who's going to be have for plus 420. Carl Deaton, I believe, training out of Syndicate, Syndicate in Las Vegas, coming on short notice. I watched his fight on uh, on PFL. And frankly, it's like this guy kind of looks like one of the guys that usually loses on like contender series and never gets a UFC contract. Like I didn't, he landed some half, half decent shots there. He seems like a bit of a brawler. I don't really know. Maybe, maybe I got to dig a little bit deeper into the tape, but I don't really know if this guy's got much of a grappling game. And that's where Joe Selecki should come in. Pretty solid wrestling, great jujitsu. Um, I don't know if Joe's just going to stand there and get into a slug him up type of war. And uh, that really seems like the only path to victory for Carl Deaton. Uh, Selecki inside the distance is like in the minus 120 range now. People have been getting on it. My big question for you is how good is Carl Deaton's grappling? Can he survive for 15 minutes? Because that may be the only angle worth attacking at this point. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I this is a fight that you got to watch. You got to watch weigh-ins 100% for Carl Deaton because he has trouble with with making weight, and now he's taking a fight on short notice. So, you know, I, I just I, I like him, right? I've always liked Carl Deaton. He's scrappy. He's uh, they call him an Anishinaabe, which is like um, well, it's a native tribe, right? And my my wife, Native American, she like spent a lot of time in this uh, Anishinaabe center. So I always like cheered for him, right? Local Michigan guy. And believe me, I try to book him for fights because he's a local Michigan guy with some veteran status, not signed to a major organization. So very familiar with Carl Dean. I've offered him a pile of fights. He never accepts, but all the same. If you look at the first like four years of his career, he fights like, I don't know, 12 times, almost all at 135 pounds, okay? 135s, 135s. Um, loses to Abel Cullum, a former flyweight at 135, eventually moves up to 145, okay? So then this fight with Nathan Williams, he comes in at 148 and a half, and he wins. So he rematches Nathan Williams. He misses weight and comes in at 147.8. Uh, so he moves up to 160 against Star Roberts Jr., okay? And then you check out this Josh Roller, at Honor FC 10. It's fights canceled. Deaton missed weight by nine pounds, and title fight was canceled. It's a title fight. There's not even a pound allowance. And Deaton missed weight by nine pounds. Unbelievable. Uh, his next fight's a catch weight of 160 because obviously he's not making weight well. He boxes, comes in at 156.8 for a 154 fight. Again, misses weight. The debut with, uh, with PFL. He made weight for that one, I guess. And then his last time out against J uh, Justin James. Sorry, two fights ago against Justin James. 156.3. So technically, you missed weight by 0. 0.3 on that one. Because it's just like one thing after another. Even there's another PFL fight. Uh, Bakbulat Magomedov, uh, PFL 2018 number four. Fight canceled. Deaton missed weight. Day of the fights. So, yeah, like I know probably some of it was you training yourself in Michigan as opposed to you being over there in, in, in Las Vegas. But here's a guy that starts his career off at 135 pounds and now can barely make 155. No, actually barely can. Can't make 155 pounds. Will miss by like 0 0.3, 0 0.4. Not super professional. So to say he's taking a fight on short notice, like chances are he's going to realize, oh, damn, dude, regional promotions can't do shit when you miss weight. But this is the UFC. They could cut you on the first try. If you, if you don't make weight and you lose, they're, you're gone. If you make weight and you lose, you're back. So there's going to be pressure to make weight from them on short notice. Just don't even know that you're going to get the best version of him. But again, watching Wayne's, I think, will be kind of key for Carl Deaton. But yeah, he's scrappy. The one thing about him is that he's super durable, right? So knocking him out is a problem. Submitting him is a problem. Therefore, you're probably going to have to fight this guy for a prolonged period. Uh, his last fight for PFL before he got cut against Alejandro Flores, he loses a split. It's a close competitive split decision. Keep in mind, he's a plus 270 underdog in that spot. So generally, he's the big underdog coming in to lose. But that durability, that ability to scrap standing and land some decent enough shots, keep it close, keep it competitive, and because you didn't actually have to make weight, he can fight 15 minutes without gassing, makes him somewhat of a dangerous opponent. Against Joe Selecki, though, I think he's got some problems. He doesn't have enough uh, straight, clean power 
to knock out Joe Selecki or to sting him and get his attention as much as he's got maybe some better volume boxing and he can chip away over time. Chipping away over time is not going to be good because it's just going to allow Joe Selecki to more time to get this takedown game going. And once he does, I think he just leaps and bounds better than Deaton on the ground, right? BJJ black belt, pretty smooth, excellent uh, transitions to the back, good back take. And once he gets a hold of you, he doesn't even need to submit you. He can just hold on. If the rear naked choke presents itself, Selecki will take it. If it doesn't present itself, he just holds on for two of the three rounds, maybe all three rounds, and wins a clean decision. Uh, Deaton on a full camp, Selecki by decision. Deaton on a week's notice, struggling on a weight cut, it, it, this very much could be a Selecki by decision. So to play it safe, I'm just going to play Selecki straight up money line, but there's no, there's no value there. So, of course, you're going to have to add it to parlays. Is Selecki a top ticket guy? I, I, I'm going to say no. I'm thinking I might throw him on the second ticket with Suarez, which would add zero value, but because you've already got two fighters on the card and you're hopefully you know close to even at that point, it would add a little bit, I suppose. But uh, I think he's got Dean's number here fairly clean. All right, we got Narulo Al- Aliyev taking on Rafael Alves, minus 180 for Aliyev, plus 155 for Al- uh, Alves. Who you got here, buddy? This could be a one that I take a bath on. At least it's early in the card. So if you want to be a straight degenerate and chase a little bit, then you could at least chase. But like, I will take Nerulo Aliyev. I just feel like Rafael Alves is super live. The reason why you like a guy like Nerulo Aliyev, even though he's Tajikistan, not Russian, is he fights like a Russian. He's very smothering. He's strong. He's physical. He uh, pushes you up against the cage. He eventually completes the takedown. And he's got some pretty murderous ground and pound. Can he keep that, that sustained pace going? Yeah. For the most part, he's been a decision guy. That's just able to, you know, get to the positions he wants and hold you down. Um, but on the contender series against Josh, Josh Wick, Wick's on short notice. Wick tried his best job to finger blast the guy in the eyes of, to avoid getting taken down. Once Ollie have took him down, it was just an absolute thrashing. That kind of ability to, you know, make it a gritty fight, grind the guy up against the cage, tire him out, take some of that zap out of him. I think that'll play well against a guy like Rafael Alves who's very explosive. He, he's, you know, got big, big, powerful techniques. He's able to land these, these big spinning hook kicks, wheel kicks, spinning back fists, flying knees. And a lot of the time he will stun you and jump to the guillotine choke. Mm-hmm. Those make him live in a fight like this because Aliyev, you know, but still fairly untested. And he's giving up a striking advantage here to Alves. Alves capable of hurting a lot of guys. And if you shoot one bad takedown or... You get hurt and shoot one bad takedown, or you even just get hurt and then, you know, curled over to the ground. He, he could grab that guillotine choke. So Alves is live for like, maybe he's an inside the distance play if you're going to play him in that I think he could catch Aliyev and knock him out. I think you could stun Aliyev and catch him with that guillotine choke. There is a path of victory for him in that he's very experienced, still only 32, so not washed. But uh, explosive and dangerous and willing to make it a, a, you know, a tough fight if need be. Whereas Aliyev is a little more unproven. He's a little untested. You haven't seen him get hurt yet. You haven't seen him have to fight out of any really bad positions. But he fights like the kind of guy you want to put your money on. You know, it's an EV, not an OV. I get it. But uh, Aliyev has got that kind of that, that smothering grind type style. Again, the way I see this particular fight playing out is that Alves is going to be most dangerous in that first round to clip him and hurt him. Actually, it's hard to say. I'll, he Most of his finishes are in the second and third round, Alves. So... He's dangerous throughout, but at the UFC level, it seems like he's most dangerous in the first round. And if he doesn't get it there, I think Aliyev just kind of grinds him away. So the play is Aliyev. Also going to have a look on the live line that if he gets smoked in the first round but doesn't get finished, maybe he can work his way back into it. Whereas Alves, if Alves doesn't finish him early, I feel like you're going to see a much slower, deliberate version of him that's going to give up the takedowns and not try to get up to his feet quite as fast. And and then all of a sudden just you know allow Aliyev to take over. Yeah, Alves is kind of a scary one. Like, I think we both got our, we're we're caught with our hands in the cookie jar against uh, against Mark yeah, Casey. Casey. Yeah, and uh, very very yeah. Like, if he find if if you leave an opening, like he can snatch like he snatches up that guillotine and it's uh, it's lights out. So that would be my concern here. How good is Aliyev? I don't think he's really been tested against you know the level of competition that Alves in the UFC has been taking on like Drew Dober like a very very solid uh a very very solid striker at least uh, that can really only be exploited mostly against people with like very very good wrestling um gets the win over Dia Casey 
um, holds his own relatively against against uh, Demir Uzmagulov, who's you know right there in the him, top yeah. fifteen, top top yeah. ten discussions. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a risky fight. I'm not really willing to to lay the juice uh, until further notice on on Aliyev because I just don't. I don't know what happens if he's put into those types of situations. If he gets caught in that in that guillotine, does he get subbed? So we'll see how weigh and shake out. Um, I'll ever so slightly lean to Aliyev with you, but um, yeah, I'm not really too sure what to make of this one at this point in time. All right, we got uh, Haley Cowan taking on Eileen Perez minus one twenty five for Cowan plus one oh five. For Perez, what's your th- what are your thoughts here, bud? Uh, this is a bog of a fight, man. Like I can see it not being particularly good. I could see it going both ways. I'm fairly confident that it's going to go 15 minutes. I just don't really think it's going to be the most exciting 15 minutes going. Haley Cowan kind of reinvented herself after a slow start to her pro career, but uh, she does her best work in the clinch. Like she wants to fight inside the clinch, and I don't really see a whole lot of significant shots out of her. She's not someone that's going to go out there and while you with volume it's just like close inside tight quarters work where she has a bit of a control and uh, she'll land some short shots and if i with claudio late on the contender series they both get a takedown she lands she outlands her 26 to 19 it's very low volume and cowan's able to muscle it out but prior to that again a lot of her fights just they take place in the clinch they're not a whole lot of finishes i kind of see this fight playing the exact same way eileen perez she comes to the UFC and we had a laugh. Oh man, you tape study. It's like, where is she fighting? Who is she fighting? And these arenas are just like abysmal. But yeah, actually some decent fighters have actually come out of that exact same promotion. So mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, it, it's a shitty cage and it's a shitty map. Big deal. It's like she's out there and scrapping people that have a desire and a want and a dream. And she's trying to take it away just as much as they're trying to take it away. So yeah, she definitely got some experience. Um, strong in the clinch, strong on top. Now, the, is she super technical? No, but she's also very, very young. Comes to the UFC, has a fight with Zara Fairn fall through, and then they give her Stephanie Edgar. So the fight's at 145, even though they're both 35ers. Uh, she looked better than I thought she would. She came out of the weigh-ins twerking, made a bit of a name for herself, and then just like didn't quite deliver in the fight, but also didn't look completely fish out of water, just not to Edgar's level of competition. Edgar's a judo black belt. Edgar's a BJJ black belt. Edgar has wins inside the UFC and is considered a seasoned veteran. She fought in Japan for Ryzen. <clears throat> that's a th- that's stiff competition. It's a tough first fight. So her now coming back to 135, her now having the debut out of the way. Yeah, I think she's going to be strong at this weight class. I think she's going to be physical. She's young, getting better. And as she gets experience, you're going to see that this is a hungry fighter that's going to come out here to scrap. As far as the striking goes, I don't think she's a very good striker, but I think she has a much higher desire to get hit in order to land one. Whereas Cowan, Cowan don't really want to exchange. She wants to get into the clinch. Once they're in the clinch, you'll see that Eileen Perez, especially down to 135, is very strong, very physical. If Cowan ends up on top, I could see Perez just working her way back up. If Perez ends up on top, she's going to land some damage because that's probably the best part of her game that you can see on tape is that she's got some decent top games. So... This is a close fight, a competitive fight, one that looks to probably go the 15 minutes, one that you wouldn't really want to have a whole lot of investment in. I would normally just chalk this up to old dog or pass situation, but Eileen Perez is a slight favorite, and I, and I do agree with her having slight favorite status, so I will, I will take her. Well, I mean, Eileen Perez is a slight underdog. Oh. Is she? Dog wow, it's pass. like plus 105. I think this fight really comes down to, like, who gets top control. And I, it, those are, like, always the hardest fights to really cap. Um, Haley, Ka- even though Eileen Perez is coming down from 145, she was definitely undersized at 145. Uh, Haley Cowan's 5'8", very, very muscularly, muscularly strong. At least early on in the fight, I think she is going to have a little bit of a strength advantage. The question becomes, as the fight goes on, is she going to be able to control? I don't know. I think it's. I think they got this one lined pretty, pretty, pretty well. Um, 
you can you can bet AFP, but it won't be me. I'll I'll ever so slightly lean with uh, Haley Cowan in this spot, but uh, not getting my money. And finally, we got Garrett Armfield taking on uh, Jose Johnson minus one fifty for Armfield, plus one thirty for Jose Johnson. Cody. Yeah, well, Jose Johnson is another one of these guys I would I would classify as like a 50-50 fighter. Like 50% of the time, he is going to bust you up. He's long, he's rangy, he's got some decent power in his hands. He's also got a really crafty, opportunistic uh, submission game. Because his, long, his limbs are so long, good arm bars, good triangle chokes. 50% of the time, he is uh, no good. Durability, not quite there. I don't think his chin's all that good. His takedown defense, suspect at times. He's uh, prone to just getting ground and pounded and kind of giving up these bad spots and not exploding back up. <clears throat> just he lives a lot to be desired. The crazy thing is, is that he had 36 amateur fights. 36 amateur fights. It probably makes him the most decorated or most seasoned American amateur MMA fighter of all times. Like It's just way too much. There's no need. And for the record, he loses his last two amateur fights. And he also loses his first two pro fights. Like, so after 36 amateur fights, he still wasn't actually ready to turn professional, where he lost to a guy that was four and five for the record. So Jose Johnson, I, I think he's always been a work in progress, a guy that's got a lot of talent, but has just battled inconsistencies. But you're seeing from him right now is that he's on a roll right now. After he lost that first time in the contender series against Ronnie Lawrence, he come back, he beat a guy with one eye by decision and Dre Miley, you know, he, he he beat Mo Miller, who's a former Contender Series washout. He beat Delaney Perry, who's a ultimate fighter washout. He beat Jack Cartwright, who is 10-0, and 0, and that gets him back to the UFC. You definitely see improvements out of his game. You definitely see where he is a dangerous fighter. I just don't know that he's ever really going to get over that hump, so to speak. He can beat guys that are you know, prospects that are kind of, you know, over-touted, not really all that good, but look good on paper. He can beat those guys. From sheer experience, he's got over 50 fights. He knows what he's doing at this point, right? But those guys that seem to be like good level of of talent, they're gonna beat him. You know, they're they're gonna get it over for him. Garrett Armfield doesn't have the prettiest looking record at eight and three, but he seems to be good to me. He's got good volume punching, good good technical boxing. I fought David Onama as an amateur, gave a pretty good account of himself. Mm -hmm. Fought him again in his UFC debut. Uh, first round again gives an okay account of himself. The longer the fight goes, he shoots a bad takedown. David Onama capitalizes and is able to uh, choke him out. But 26 years old, out of Killcliff FC, he's got teammates on the card. He's in one of the best gyms. He's still young, making improvements. And it seems like grappling has been his issue. His submission defense has been his issue. In terms of his offensive boxing uh, coming on a full camp as well, I think he'll be more than fine against Jose Johnson. So the real key here is that we've talked about this on a few of the fights already is if it's going to be striker versus grappler, who's going to be able to, you know, implement their game. But in Johnson's case is wrestling not very good, man. He's long. He's lanky. If you want to take him down, go ahead. <clears throat> His offensive wrestling is not all that good. So I don't think he takes down Garrett Armfield. Therefore, he's going to have to stand with him. And in the small cage, that length not going to be effective, uh, not going to be as effective. Armfield should be able to back him up, cut the cage off, land combinations, go to the body, beat him up. And if he doesn't knock him out, I think he just wins the decision. But I think there's a good chance he might be able to just clip him and put him away. I mean, yeah, two contender series fights for Jose Johnson, taken down 18 times. 18 times. Ronnie Lawrence. <laughs> Man. I mean, Ro Ronnie Lawrence yeah. took him down six times and then follows that up with Jack Cartwright taking him down six times. Um, you know me. I'm not, I'm not backing somebody who... Cannot stop a takedown. I know Ronnie Lawrence is, you know, is relentless and he doesn't really have too much uh, top control. He's not able to hold people down. But like 18 times over the course of two fights against lower level competition, like we're not we're not taking on Habib here. I know you love Ronnie Lawrence, but he isn't he isn't the eagle of uh, of Florida by any stretch of the imagination. Um, I there's no way I could put money on somebody that that shows that type of deficiency. You bring up some good points about Garrett Armfield. Um, not that he's a wrestler. He's going to be able to do it, but like the, the training partner that training partners that he's putting in the, the, the work, the room that he's working in on a daily basis makes him a rightful favorite in my mind. Um, I'm going to be waiting for Wayne's this week. I've been, uh, I need to get off the mat and I don't really want to, uh, get too deep, uh, this early in the week, uh, I'm going to wait for the, the, you know, the whole story to be told, whether it's interviews, 
glean some more information. I don't have any bets yet on prize picks. The stuff that uh, really the Tatiana Suarez fantasy points over. I like that. I think she can get to it a whole bunch of different ways. Um, other than that, uh, hit him with the PRP kid. Yeah. So PRP this week, we're going to go with Nikita Krylov, Brendan Allen, dog number one, Augusto Sakai. My God. Tatiana Suarez, Mike Malott, Trevor Peak, uh, Jasmine Jassadavici is dog number two. Jordan Levitt is technically dog number three. Charles Johnson, uh, Joe Selecki, Narulo Aliyev, Eileen Perez, dog number four, Garrett Armfield. So it sounds okay, 13 fights, four underdogs. But uh, yeah, just like last week, whatever. It was like mostly favorites. But you, as long as you get your 50-50s and you get those slight plus monies, then whatever, it is what it is. Those will be the underdogs that we're looking for. In terms of people that you would like actually feel confident about, I think, again, I don't know what the top two tickets will look like, but I'm assuming that, you know, Mike Mallott, Trevor Peak, um, Charles Johnson, right there, you got a plus 255. You put a Joe Selecki on there, you put a Tatiana Suarez on there, that's a plus 380. Pretty good. Now, if I can just squeeze a Garrett Armfield, mm, don't get greedy, Cody. If I only get a Garrett Armfield, it's a plus seven eleven, and like that, that would be fine. So of course, you put a little Krylov on there, twelve to one. You build out, you build out. Uh, we just need that little core group of fighters to come through for us. So again, not sure who will lead the dance with at the very top two, but as Paul mentioned, watch Wayne's. Wayne's super important. Last week, one of the biggest things I did was all week I wasn't excited about the cards. Like I didn't actually lock anything earlier. I was just like, man, I. Half of this car hasn't fought in three years. The other half are making their debuts. And like six of them have weight cutting trouble. So I watched the weigh-ins and like nothing really changed from the preview show. But um, I think I think the more fights there are, the less time you have to analyze. The more guys are just coming in injured or, or sick or they're looking for the payday. It's like the weigh-ins is that last important piece of information that you can get. So, of course, I'll, I'll wait to lock in whoever the top two for the parlays purposes are. Until then... But yeah, if just you know we get the bounces like we did last week, I think we're going to be in good hands for at least those those top three lines. Yeah, uh, I mean Charles Johnson, like I like him, but it seems like the market's moving towards uh, like people, you know, actions coming in on Ode Osborne. So it's like I don't feel the need to hop on to really any of these lines. Like the, the, the we we've talked about it on like other episodes that like. These days, like by the time we get to Wednesday, it's just like these lines have been out for. I mean Krylov versus span was released when did this open of course it's not going to load up for me right now i mean these these lines are out for like at least a month by the time we get here now so it's like the people and like a lot of the props are moving super super fast so it's like it's really really tough like beating especially if you're you're jumping in on a wednesday it's like you're not really beating the market anymore on wednesday it's like you needed to get in on those props on monday to actually beat the market. So rather than being early, it's better to be right. So I'm going to be minding my P's and Q's a little bit more. I don't need to snatch them up um, right now, unless I'm taking stuff uh, long before we even record the show. But uh, this week, I don't have anything in yet. Interest is in uh, Charles Johnson. And then we'll see with Suarez how I attack that. I, I definitely want to have money in, involved in it. I like it's Augusto Sakai too, but uh, yeah, those are kind of the spots I'm considering. But uh, we'll we'll see where the where my money actually ends up by the end of the week. Anyway, that is it for us this week. Hope you enjoyed the show. For producer Megan and Cody Saptic, I'm Paul Shaughnessy. Saying goodbye and good luck. Oh.